Welcome, everybody. This is May 14, and this is the webinar on doing business with Italy. My name is Christian Höfele, at least that's what my mom would say. Most people here in the US call me Christian and then butcher my last name. And with me today is Antimo Cimino, and I hope I said the name properly. Did I? You did. Ciao a tutti. <laughs> Ciao a tutti. Uh, buonasera if you're in Italy. Um, buongiorno if you're on the East Coast. Um, if it's morning, how do you say good morning? Is it also buongiorno? Or? It's buongiorno. If it's afternoon, you would say buon pomeriggio. Buon pomeriggio. Okay. So now we covered all the time zones, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. So let me pull up our screen because we have stuff to share with you folks. All right. So, again, my name is Christian. With me today is Antimo. I'm so happy to have him join me today for this session. And even though I am a lover for Italy, a true sucker for everything Italy, um, I am not necessarily the best person to um, teach on, on Italian culture and Italian business culture. And that's why I have Antimo with me today. Um, some of you may be joining a culture mastery webinar for the first time so to those of you welcome to the tribe those of you who are return visitors welcome back and you will notice as we go through this webinar today there will be a portion that is a bit more culture general um, to create basically the foundation the skeleton of the body of culture and then antimo will help me put some meat on these bones and and create the the full bella figura italiana um, <laughs> and We'll, we'll share with you some insights um, about Italian culture, about Italian business culture, um, fight some of those pesky stereotypes some of us may have around Italian business. And, and if, if those stereotypes may actually hold up in real world as a generalization that manifests itself in day to day, then we'll put some context around it and make sure that you decipher it properly and not put it in that drawer that says, uh, me no likey. So that, that's what we're gonna do here today. So for those of you who are repeat visitors, please understand that the Culture General piece may be something that you've seen us present before, yet I think it is still important for those of you who are joining us for the first time and repeat time that we put this in context. There is no such thing as one national culture. We need to put everything in context. Now, I have said my piece who I am and most people who engage with the Culture Mastery webinars have come across me in some way or another, that's why you're here. You may have not met Antimo yet. Um, so Antimo, I'll give you two or three minutes to tell the la, la gente out there who, who you are. Thank you, Christian. Uh, it's a, a fantastic uh, opportunity and a pleasure to be here. And I know there's uh, people from all over the, the world, so that's uh, awesome. Um, Antimo Cimino, um, I own a company that uh, specializes in experiential travel, that's uh, Vumago, and as you can uh, imagine, that's uh, kind of on hold right now, given the circumstances. Mm. But uh, the other uh, company that I founded a couple of years ago with another three team members, uh, some of them are on the call, one being Marcia, and uh, uh, that company is Cultural Global Labs. And Cultural Global Labs is, a, is about achieving growth and developing leaders in a way uh, by creating learning programs that are around our five pillars. And those are uh, vulnerability, the power of stories that creates connections. And uh, when connections are built in an authentic way, it leads to transformation which in turn leads to uh, growth and outcomes. So that's a pretty much you know, the framework we follow in uh, the programs and the conferences and the online webinars that we also hope to uh, um, offer soon. And we are in the middle of uh, redoing the website. We're adjusting to the current circumstances to offer you better learning opportunities until we can meet again face to face because our first event that was going to happen in southern Italy in my hometown, not really hometown, but home region of Puglia, is being postponed now to 2021. Mm. Uh, a little bit about my story. 
I am born and raised in Italy. My entire family is in Italy. I'm from the long region at the end of the boot called the Puglia, uh, that it's in between the Adriatic and the Ionian Sea. And I came to Portland, Oregon 25 years ago with a mix of reasons between relationships and then a, wanting to study here. Long story, I, as I was a studying business, I landed on, inter, on a class about intercultural communication and Pandora Box opened up for me and I felt like this is where I belong. I want to become an expert in this so that I can make the best contribution to the world through uh, lived experiences of having lived in England, in France, in the US, in Brazil, speaking six languages. And so this is my world. This is what I live and breathe uh, very, very passionately. So again, this is a great opportunity for me to talk about doing business with Italy. And, I, and we'll do it with Kristen, we'll do it in a different way. Kristen will put his uh, general framework in place. And I will also add another interesting uh, framework in, um, that helps us all to understand what happens in the brain. And I'm very, very passionate lately about understanding what happens as we learn in the brain. What, uh, what can the understand what happens in the brain contribute in our journey to learn, adapt, and change to especially a different culture? Mm. So that's how uh, we're going to approach this today. Beautiful. Thank you for the, for the introduction, Antimo. Um, now, now that you guys know where we are from, so Sono Tedesco, I'm the German who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and Antimo, um, il ragazzo italiano in, in Portlandia. Now, Ooh, yes. <laughs> and we also have somebody in the chat box that mentioned that they're in Firenze so Sheila is in Firenze oh, wonderful. so Ciao. if you don't mind dear folks use the chat box and type in where in the world you are joining us from today so we want to know where you are um, and you can do this as as we go along today and this is also the space where I would invite you to Put your questions in. I know there's also a Q&A feature here on, on Zoom. In order for us to, to streamline it and to keep it together in one place, because as we record this, we will also record the chat. So we have it in all, all in one place. So you can um, put all your comments, your suggestions, your questions, or answers to some of the questions in the chat box. So there is quite I, a few people. I, um smiling because I'm seeing all the participants saying where are they from and really where are they from yeah. everywhere on the map. So this is awesome. Dear to me that somebody from Florence is also on I have family in Florence and that's where I used to live before I moved to Portland. Nice. So, so we have quite a few Portlandians here, quite a few people from the US, from Germany, from Iceland. I think this is a first. I'm not We're I don't know as well. Yeah, Morocco and a bunch of people from Germany and Slovakia and what am I missing here? Mexico. United Kingdom. Beautiful, beautiful. Awesome. Annika from Sweden. Now that is beautiful. Rottweil, Germany. Oh, that I've been to that place. Uh, Rabat. Oh, so if you're calling in from the Arabic world, I just want to say Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Karim to all of you and thank you for joining us during this holy season for you. Excellent. Well, this is beautiful. Oh, Colombia. Oh, man, this is this is a truly international webinar. I'm excited, Antimo. This is great. So Hello. let's get let, let's get started because we got a lot yeah. of ground to cover. And we're gonna start doing this right away. Um, I'm gonna frame it. Yes, we set this up for an hour. And given the fact that Antimo and I are both really passionate about this, we may just get to talking. So be prepared. It might take longer. And if you have to jump off at the hour, we won't hold that against you because the recording, <laughs> the recording keeps going. So we'll make sure that you get the recording and whatever you miss, you, you'll, well, sorry that you had to miss it, but we'll make sure to capture it. Um, so Marcia is asking, can you ask people to share with all panelists attendees? Yes. So if you haven't figured that out yet in the chat box, there is a blue, should be blue, at least on my end it's blue. There is a blue drop down where you type your message and it says either to all panelists or to individual panelists. So you can chat amongst each other privately. Sure, do that. And we won't be able to capture that. We will only capture your comments, questions, ideas if you chat to all panelists and to all panelists and attendees. So make sure that's panelists 
and attendees so everybody can see it. Excelente. Thank you for that reminder, Marshall. Let's get started. So as we travel into Italy and most Europeans as they travel into Italy, at least I'm coming from my own perspective because whenever I travel to Italy, I came from the north um, since I'm Italian. So I came across the Alps, across the uh, Brenner, Brennero Pass, and I entered the Autostrada into, into northern Italy, into, into Alto Adige and Trentino, and nobody told me that sometimes there'll be different behaviors, and those behaviors are not always deciphered immediately, and we have to make sense of the difference. That's what Antimo and I and many of us in our industry do. We help our clients make sense of difference, and today we will identify some of the most important cultural values of Italy. We want you to learn how to understand how these values impact everything that you do, whether it's work or outside of work. It impacts how we communicate with each other. And I'm, I'm already channeling my inner Italian, right? So I'm already <laughs> using a lot more. A great <laughs> job. Very good job, man. No, and and I, I, let, me, let me frame that real quick. So when I first came to the United States, people were like, you're not tall, blonde, blue-eyed. And I said, yeah, and that's a stereotype that we Germans don't like very much either. Thank you very much. <laughs> and But there's a, there's a historic reason. The part of Germany that I am from is the very south, which was under the rule of the Roman Empire for many, many decades. So can you think that the Romans maybe left a little bit of their gene pool brown eyes <laughs> i'm a bit stubby i'm not the tallest i got brown hair well now a bit graying and i talk with my hands when i get excited so who knows there might be some genetic influence that crossed the alps at one point so culture impacts everything we do right and we want you to develop an understanding of how the these values um have a influence over, the, over business dynamics, how we make negotiations, how we come to agreements, or how we disagree in a, in a mutually beneficial way, and just how you can improve your work in social relationships with Italian clients, with Italian customers, with Italian teammates, all right? So uh, I think I already said that, why, why culture matters, so we can skip that slide altogether. Um, and be aware that not always is what we think we know the answer. And Italy is a country and a culture that both in my world and the Ger German speaking world and the English speaking world is full of, well, supposed knowledge. So people in the Anglo world and people in the Germanic world think they know Italy. And whatever they think they know is sometimes a bit dangerous because you see the biggest piece of this pie is what we're not even aware of that we don't know. And Antimo and I are here today to fill in some of those blanks, some of those blind spots that we may have because um, unfortunately there's a lot of stereotypes around Italian culture that are often misconstrued or put into a context that is not appropriate or adequate. And um, let, let's do away with some of those. And that's why I want to hear from you folks that are on here. We got a ton of people. I think, Antimo, this is one of the uh, most well-attended uh, webinars oh. we've had in a long time. Very happy to see you. It's probably not because of me, because they've seen me before. It's got to be. <laughs> so um, I, want to, I want to see in the chat box, are you currently working with Italians or have you done that in the past? And if so, how comfortable are you? What are some of the challenges? What is it that you would like to learn here today? What is it you want to take away? So feel free to type that into the chat box and we'll, we'll pick it up as we go. Um, if, you can, if you can't think of a challenge right now, there might be one coming up as we continue talking. So I want to make sure that your questions are, are addressed and um, should we not be able to address them during the time that we spend here together, we'll, we'll find out um, a way to answer them in the follow-up. So Brett Perry from Chicago, our Aussie friend, says a lot of Italian clients that have moved to the U.S. Yes. Sheila says, I've worked with Italians. I'm very comfortable working with them. Christy says, she's worked with Italians in brief. You live there. Excellent. So Elena Junko says, she's very comfortable. With it. Oh, awesome. Susanna Jasper from Texas via Germany. I know Susanna. By the way, Belated happy birthday, Susanna. You had your birthday this week. What is the best way to build a relationship with Italians and how long does it typically take? Months or years? Excellent question. Chris Cartwright, 
another Portlandian, I believe, says yeah. <laughs> communication styles and time management to be aware. Excellent questions. Karin Brunemann says she's lived in Italy for six months and find Italians absolutely great to work with. Excellent. So we've got a mix of yeah, yeah. challenges and great experiences. Now, and, and mm -hmm. go ahead, Antimo. Questions, you know, there are fantastic questions. Uh, we have to be careful because in this short time, we can't really address everything. So we're going to probably keep a fairly general here as well. And uh, one other factor that I see, there is a lot of people from Italy as well. And uh, it, for me, it's an honor. Uh, I will encourage, however, everyone to start embracing um, learning with humility right now. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I don't have all the answer to it all. Um, I, what I would say in my view on things may differ from yours, uh, your lived experience. And, uh, but that's all part of the learning. And um, so, yeah. Um, keep that uh, attitude about what we're uh, doing today here and uh, how we're learning, learning together. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't know if you uh, want to say something about uh, uh, the fact that I'm going to show a very brief video. Yes. And we tested it, but Zoom doesn't really support video sharing as, as uh, uh, well. And that the pictures may be a little delayed. You should still be able to enjoy it. But then after... Uh, um, Christian will send you a link so that you can uh, see that uh, better after the call. Yes, so, and it's, it's, a, it's a short video, so it won't take too much of your time. Before we go into the video, I want to I highlight something that I've done in all our, our country-specific uh, and culture-specific webinars in the past. I want you to be aware, um, whether you've, you're with, with us here for the first time or you're a repeat visitor, I cannot stress this enough. There are the things that we notice about other cultures, the things that our five senses pick up, our sight, our uh, sense of touch, of taste and smell and, and, and hearing. We, we notice something about another culture. We hear the music, we hear the language, we eat the food, we see the architecture, the sights, the way people dress, um, the way they cover their faces or heads or hair, um, how they stand close or not close to each other. Um, all, all the things that we can pick up with our senses. This is what's above the water surface in this image. This is this is the is it an, a reptile? I believe it's or an amphibian. I don't. I'm not a biologist. Mm -hmm. So th this animal with the sharp teeth has eyes in a nostril sticking out above the water surface. This is the stuff that we can easily pick up from another culture and we draw our conclusions from it. These are the do's and the don'ts that we can memorize or take with us in the form of a phone app or a book or however you want to do it. And underneath the water surface where the pointy teeth are, where the powerful jaws are, and you don't see it in the picture, but there's a very powerful tail and an animal that can whack you unconscious and even kill you. <laughs> When, when, when we're not aware of what drives the do's and don'ts and what drives these do's and don'ts and fl floats them up above the water surface are the whys, the underlying belief systems, the traditions, the values, how people create their world, how they model the world in their mind and how they, how they think and feel and believe. And this is not something you can learn from a book. This is something that you have to experience yourself. And that is a constant practice for all of us who cross cultures. And with this, I'm going to give the screen to Antimo so he can share a little video with us. I was laughing a little bit because you kind of paint a little bit of a scary picture, but it's actually you know, interesting how you have to be aware so that you can know a little bit what expect, right? Mm. So between uh, you, Christian, and Brett Perry, uh, kind of raising awareness about the upcoming workshop about doing business with Italians, you created and painted a picture of uh, uh, taking a trip to Italy. So I decided because of the tourist, uh, tourist tour company that I have, that I give you a little flavor by sharing my desktop here and uh, briefly playing a video uh, from my company that I put together so that I can take you on a virtual trip very quickly to Italy and in particular my region of Puglia. So most of the images you will see here are from my region. And this is Puglia for you.
Is it my mother teaching how to make a pizzeria di pasta? These are actually being harvested right now. Antimo, what are these called? What's the name of this type of pasta? Pizzariedi o lagani. From one province to another, the name can change. Mm, and we'll all practice that, and by the end of the webinar, you all This is my this. family in the summertime, during the riposo time. And you will notice imagery that we will pick apart later. These are all images chosen yeah. by design, not just because exactly. we feel like it. This is, was a three hours lunch, by the way. <laughs> so it was a, a quick lunch then, okay. Yeah, a quick lunch. Mm. A great example of improvising when somebody sees Americans in town and um, they grab you and start dancing with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that, beautiful. Uh, I'm, I miss this country. As Christian said, that was uh, in per particularly put together the way it was because uh, we probably make a few references to that. But allow me to also do a little piece here of another general framework that I like to take because... Uh, in the last two years, I've been very, very passionate in uh, studying uh, neuroscience, and I find it extremely useful to have this as another additional general framework to keep in mind when you're working across your culture into, uh, with another cultural, um, uh, a different culture. Um, and so, in essence, uh, what neuroscience tells us is that in the exchange, whether you are in a teamwork, again, working in country, but with uh, people from different cultures, you are solving problem on a management team, you're going to Italy and uh, having a week of meetings with uh, all kinds of Italians uh, or, again, other cultures, uh, the brain is doing a certain work. And what happens, though, in general, is that the brain, and we are uh, made this way, we only hear and see what we expect. And it's funny that this reminds me uh, and makes the connection with that picture where you see the eyes, but underneath, you don't know what's uh, underneath. And so, and that to stop and think about this framework, you know, what, I, what I just said, it is to bring up the awareness that uh, we only see what uh, we uh, expect. We hear what we expect and we should be prepared to also enjoy, see, and understand or appreciate the unexpected. So in essence, the brain is at work constantly creating this uh, mind maps, shortcuts, the neural pathways are at work creating very complex uh, uh, set of patterns so that the, um, our perception quickly goes to that and um, assigns meaning. Uh, but we have to be careful with that method because oftentimes that is also how uh, stereotypes is at play all the time. We see something, we think of the stereotype, oh, I know what this means, but there's more to that. In fact, from that video, I want to take you to a deeper dive into what um, some of the cultural values of Italy are all about. And uh, moving forward, I will show you another one uh, of the slides. This is uh, the work from uh, David Rock, and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, David Rock, who is a, a neuroscientist who's done a lot of work uh, on this matter. And uh, no matter what your social interaction is, whether again, uh, just uh, within friends, within your country, but in particularly when you uh, are doing cross-cultural work, um, there is uh, five human basic impulses that we, uh, the brain is uh, tracking. And that, those are, as you can see from the slide, the status, the certainty is this situation, um, you know, uh, 
safe? Um, am I am I outlining my sense of self um, uh, protected? Um, is how am I relating to other people? Is this situation fair for all? So in essence, uh, 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 an intercultural encounter oftentimes can trigger a sense of anxiety, can trigger a sense of loss, and in particular can trigger resistance because our brain works in a way that goes to comfortable uh, values, comfortable mind maps that are ingrained in our value set. But when we are going to communicate across culture, all of a sudden there is this resistance because there isn't a match. So we have to take our lenses off, our cultural lenses on, off, and put maybe another set of lenses to be able to see what we are not immediately seeing, you know? And so the brain, the brain in this uh, instance is doing a lot more work, but if we prepare ourselves ahead of time with this, even just this basic knowledge, we can handle the situation more smoothly. Our confidence goes up. We are more relaxed entering the communication with another culture. And most, most important of all, I think, uh, the, we, are, we are more receptive to change. Because like it or not, when we're communicating across a cultural divide, we need to be open to change. We need to stay flexible. We need to stay adaptable. Because we cannot run the risk of coming across arrogant, of imposing our value onto another culture. Because in the building of trust, especially with Italians, that is very, very critical. You have to show a certain adapt adaptability to it. And so then uh, finally, I wanna show you also really what are the parts of the brain that uh, certain things happen and how the brain works, but very succinctly. The brain in essence tries to use the least amount of energy. It's uh, lazy and it wants to uh, uh, tap into stored memory. Those are roadmaps, those are quick uh, bits of information so that it's not construing a new reality, okay? When we're doing that, uh, when we are sensing certain emotion from an experience we're having, when the emotions of the Italians are coming to us as they are uh, communicating, we are experiencing emotions right in the amygdala ganglia area. That's where everything uh, starts at first and our brain stores information of that kind, whether we're feeling mm, mistrust, a sense of, oh, uh, the, 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 the Italians are lively, this is nice, I'm, I'm having fun. Um, this is a system one of uh, information where the brain, again, uses the least amount of energy. But when we start to feeling, oh, wait a minute, what's really this meaning? What does it mean there's a high pitch going up and down? What does it mean being interrupted constantly? The brain is trying to do a lot more work relying on the prefrontal cortex because there isn't enough coded information that allows you to understand it quickly. You have to work harder, therefore using more energy. So, and this is useful because again, um, in changing and adapting to another culture, what we have to understand is now we are capable human beings Things. We have an amazing ability to adapt, but the problem is that we have to suspend a little bit our uh, frame of reference of our cultural values, and we have to, as we observe, we have to be willing uh, to, to do that work, okay? If you don't send that signal to your brain, then resistant, resistance goes up, okay? So, um, and I think I'm going to have you uh, explain a little bit of... Uh, uh, the, the, the differences in uh, some values on a continuum right. uh, I know you have prepared for us. And, 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 and thank you for this, Antimo. And, and there were questions in the chat box uh, inquiring about the, uh, the authorship of this work, who, what, what's the science behind it. And I just want to make sure that you all know that in the follow-up emails that you will receive from us, we will post some, some reference links where you can find more information about that. Now, um, as we have done so in past uh, webinars on, on crossing cultures, we included a few frameworks that allow us to get a little bit closer systematically to what drives different cultures, what, what, how can we measure their behavior, and how can we um, predict some of these behaviors and, and compare them to our quote-unquote normal, to our default or behavioral default. One of the frameworks we often use in our training programs is a tool called the Globe Smart Profile. It's a, a validated um, assessment instrument based on a standardized questionnaire that's been around for many, many years, and it allows us to sort um, behavioral preferences according to 
national cultures. And as I said in the beginning, uh, please be aware that this is a somewhat limited instrument because no, uh, there is no such thing as the Italian or the German or the American or whatever other nationality we're talking about. Um, however, there are general trends that are measurable and noticeable within certain nation cultures. We want to Pay attention to the nuance, obviously, and we will go through that in in a couple of minutes. But we will we will uh, approach different cultural uh, behavioral prototypes from thirty thousand feet above ground, and then we'll lower our altitude and get a little closer and 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 use a different lens to get closer to that. So, GlobeSmart uses five dimensions, five bipolar opposite behavioral spectrums to compare um, human behavior. You see the top one is independence versus interdependence or um, a uh, individualistic culture independent uh, compared to a group oriented collectivist culture interdependent. And you see here we plotted six different countries on, on this grid. We used Italy in the, in the center and we used another European culture, mine, just because I can, and then the US because that's where both Antimo and I live. And we also used an Asian and a South American and an African culture to plot against it. And you see that Italy in general leans somewhat to the more group orientation. They're not as collectivist as some might assume. And since this is a median value, if you go to Northern Italy, to the industrial centers of Italy, Milano, uh, Trieste, Turino, you will find much more independence versus um, a much more group oriented South as, as, as Antimo will, will go into this in a, in a second. Second dimension you see here, um, egalitarianism versus status or flat hierarchies versus strong steep hierarchies. We already had some questions in the chat box about how do I recognize a hierarchy in an organization? How do I best deal with it? Here again, you see Italy leaning towards more hierarchical compared to um, North American or Northern European cultures, which tend to be a little bit more egalitarian. Third dimension is how comfortable is a culture with taking risks? And you see Italy um, somewhat in the center with four other cultures here. And you see the outlier in our comparison is here, the US that's very much risk comfortable or is, is, is okay with going into the unknown much more than um, the other cultures that we're comparing here. Fourth dimension, how do we communicate very directly or rather indirectly? Um, you see my, my fellow country people are known or infamous for being very, very direct. And then you see Italy a lot less direct and again, regional differences. The more, the more you go into rural areas and you, the more you go into the southern half of the boot, it, it'll, it'll become a, probably a little less direct. And then finally, the, um, the dimension between task and relationship, what's more important, getting the job done regardless of how much I like you, or is it important that we have enough sustainable trust and mutual sympathy for each other before we can actually get something done? So I noticed that Ivana has raised her hand and now she found the chat box and she said, I find Italians to be more direct than Americans. Interesting. Let's address this right away, Antimo. Um, Ivana thinks um, that Italians, or in her experience, Italians are a little more direct than Americans. What's your response? I think it has, to do, it has to do with not being afraid of show your emotion what you mean. So you mm -hmm. say what you mean. You wear your emotion on your sleeves. And therefore, we come a lot more as direct, uh, perhaps, as the Americans are. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally find that uh, it depends, really. Um, and it all is, you know, it, you have to look at the context also of the team and the group of people that you're uh, working with. Because let's say you are working on a, uh, with a business on a team in Milan, but part of the uh, uh, employees and the colleagues of this uh, business are also... Uh, coming from the south, have a global experience. They may not be uh, as uh, direct um, as uh, uh, maybe some people whose uh, life has been more around that company, that uh, city, uh, industrial, if you will. Um, so that's what I think uh, influences the idea that uh, we may be more direct than the Americans, especially our ability to show emotions. Um, and I would like to add to that because 
it, uh, the, there's no such thing as the Americans, right? So you, you also find these regional differences within the United States or with the English speaking world of North America. I want to include a, a big part of Canada as well. I live in the, in the southeastern quadrant of the United States where people are a lot less direct than they are in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in New York, or in Boston. And if you go to the urban centers of California, people will be quite a bit more direct than they are in the south, but not as direct as they are on the east coast. So even uh, in, most, in most nation cultures, you will find nuances to this. And as I said in the beginning, um, a tool like, like this will only give us a, an approximation to the answer. And the, the actual answer to your individual situation may be buried in, at, at a deeper level, at a, at a different yeah. altitude. And, and Chris, already, Chris Cartwright already commented in the chat box that it's called, and now I've, I've, I've scrolled over it, it's um, emotionally, attached. Em, em, emotionally attached. attached communication style. Well, let's look at a framework developed yeah. um, or introduced by Aaron Meyer. Go ahead, Anton. Uh, I would say also one other thing that uh, uh, so as another general application, if you're doing business with other culture, uh, it's very useful to, uh, to take a tool as GlobeSmart and plot on uh, even just the previous slide shows where everybody's style on, that, on different continuums of each value is. And that gives you a little bit of a, a roadmap on who are you dealing with, what might be at play mm -hmm. during your cultural exchange. That's, I think it's, I like that a lot and it helps a lot of people as well as this kind of uh, graph where you are seeing the confrontational and avoid a confrontational avoidance on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis the emotional expressiveness or unexpressiveness and you see the quadrant where italy is and spain and france and russia and israel which are very much the same they're very high emotionally expressive so you can see that in confrontation when uh, uh, there is a level of confrontation in the dialogue all of a sudden, the Italians will show way more inflection, change, uh, you know, pitch of uh, voice and uh, articulated uh, and more outpouring of emotions, which will intimidate and possibly frustrate a lot of people who mm -hmm. have the tendency to look at that as a drama. Oh, my God, he's losing it. Uh, I wonder what all this means. Uh, or even the fact that uh, uh, when the dialogue becomes quote unquote intense, because uh, people are talking over each other, uh, it can be, can be looked at as disrespectful. But mm -hmm. for us, for most Italians, that shows I'm engaged. Right. I am following you. I care about this. And that's Let's why I'm allowed to talk over you, Antimo, right? You won't, you won't hold it against me if I talk yeah. over you, right? No, in fact, yeah. we, we can continue to talk over each other, but I am listening. I'm tuned into your message to me right. and vice versa. And I don't know, sometimes it feels weird to even say this, but it feels like we are born with a capacity to have multiple conversations at the same time, having the message we want to portray, but at the same time, hearing the conversation in front of me and the one to the side. And then this becomes very intimidating for most people to interrupt. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, there might be some Italians who think, okay, I'm not being interrupted. That person isn't really showing interest, perhaps. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that's all the time the case, but you have to be a little bit bold in not necessarily waiting for your turn to speak because that may come across as not as engaged, not as interested. Right. There was another point when we were talking about this that uh, uh, Sheila Corwin said um, uh, that sometimes Italians uh, uh, provide different answer, answers for the same message. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes, um, I want to explain it this way. Uh, if, depending on where you sit in the organization, depending on the hierarchy, depending on the relationships that you are keeping up, um, you may want to give an answer for the sake of giving an answer and saying, yes, I heard you, I think this is it, but don't take it as the ultimate answer because if that person has a relationship with another person that needs to know about this, the answer may be different to you until he has or she has consulted with that person and gave you a more straight answer. Right. So in, it, in Italy, meetings are never, uh, final answers are never happening in the same room as the meeting. You mm -hmm. have to pause, go socialize, maybe a day, maybe two, maybe a week to get some answers because there is layers within the hierarchy of that community or of that organization that need to be checked consulting to get to the one answer.
Nice. Th thanks for clarifying that. And I want to honor uh, Mar Marsha's comment in the chat, uh, which is, is more related to the S and other uh, big, big uh, geographical countries that in every country there is uh, cultures within the culture. And yes, that's very much true. That's true for the US. That's true for, um, for many countries that have seen a, a higher degree of ethnic diversity and that have seen a high degree of of regionalism and and historically determined cultural diversity and that is very much true for for Italy as well this is true for my home country of Germany this is true for Italy um, but both the, the current day Germany and the current day Italy did not always look this way on the map throughout our 2000 or something years of history it, it had many different iterations and that's why there is no such thing as the Italy or the one Italian way. Um, Antimo, uh, shed some light on this, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So in essence, uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, while we do have a pride of a nation as the Italians, we do uh, look at the um, Italian flag uh, uh, with pride. Uh, perhaps it's fair to say that there is more regionalism pride. I am more proud of being a Southern Italian Pugliese than I am, can say I'm Italian. And uh, here is another insight to some of you uh, who live in the US. Um, when you're asked about uh, the culture you come from, the ethnic background you come from, there isn't a box for me to, uh, to, to tick. But when I say other, my answer is always Mediterranean culture. So being closer, being from the South and being closer to the Mediterranean, I feel it is more encompassing of a certain similar behavior to other countries in the Mediterranean that I belong to than I actually see myself closer to a Northern Italian. So that, of course, it plays into within the identity of each person you are dealing with. So that's why I say it could be a team in Milan that you're working with, but if there is somebody there that has a responsibility and a predominant uh, role in the organization whose experience is vastly coming from the South, that person is likely to communicate and interact with you at a different level. There will be relationship building and trust building that is slightly different. That person might be more um, willing to invite you to social after hours event, even with their family, and maybe a Northern Italian, not so much, because that's a more distinctive uh, private life versus public life, formal, informal. Right. Um, so, you know, that's what we have to be careful uh, about as well. And we have to also uh, um, take into consideration the historical context of a, of a culture. And that takes us to the next slide, because I want to share with you that uh, it's very important to pay attention, read, educate yourself about everybody's culture's uh, history, because it does have a very, it leaves a very strong imprint on even today's uh, behavior of who the Italians are, why the Italians think the way they do, why do they act the way they do. In particular, in Italy, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, I say that because if you think about, sometimes people say that we're not as productive as other nations. Well, think about what the Romans, how much infrastructure the Romans built that we still walk on today, streets that we still walk on today. And yet the Romans are also just famous about uh, laying down the pool and uh, sipping wine and being attended to and socialized. And that's where, you know, our hardworking and lifestyle that we actually love to uh, uh, play hard and not work as hard or, mm. you know, keep the balance in between the two. Uh, the Renaissance that brought us um, a, a rebirth in uh, not only in the art expression, but in science and finance. Uh, the fact that uh, Italy didn't really become a united modern uh, national state until 18, 1861, thanks to Garibaldi, right? So those, and that is not too far away from in history. And, uh, and still today, we often talk, even at a political level, of a, a certain division between the North and the South. And mm -hmm. that's need, need to be understood. And, uh, is, and that's, I think, even- Isn't it funny how this also plays well in, in the United States about the same time in history, right? The Northern, North and South conflict in the US right about the 1860s. Same in Germany, by the way, 1860s, North and Southern Germany. So there is some historic parallel. Of course, there's not a complete overlap. But for those of you who, who are familiar with North American culture and, and North European culture, there is, um, there is that 
what we have in common. We're not only focusing on the differences, uh, but we want to work out that, that there is something that we, that we have a shared experience of, even though none of us lived in that time, but this is how, how our current day cultures have been shaped throughout history. And that's why it's important to understand this about Italy. Yeah, and lastly, World War II, which is uh, uh, nothing to forget uh, for many, many reasons, but in essence, it gave the Italian the resilience the ability to reinvent themselves, to be flexible, to go with what they had, uh, because it was a very, very tough time and lived very, very differently between the North, who was more industrial, and the South. So the South tends to be a lot more concerned about uh, protecting their assets, being more conservative about uh, the risk, uh, keeping the status quo rather than taking the risk. You know, all of those things have to be understood in the, con in the historical context of uh, dealing with Italians. Right. And I think it's also interesting to now start going maybe to the values one by one and talk about them. And I am conscious that we have only 15 minutes to go over that and I don't wanna rush through them. But uh, it's very hard to understand um, or to place uh, whether it's family or la bella figura one, you know, in a number one, number two. They're all very, very important. Important. Family is inc incredibly important because um, when doing business with the, uh, Italians uh, and because of those differences that we have talked about already, you could be dealing with a big business in a, a corporate in a Milan, but uh, underneath what you don't see, that company may, be, ha may have relationships and dealings with smaller entities. Let's say you're, it's, uh, it's in the industry of um, leather, making seats for cars. And, and because there is a, a family businesses that started a, a century or two ago that specialize in the working of the letters, that company relies and does business partner with a family company. And, and that already is different. So imagine when an organization and a team is trying to make a decision, how it's not so easy to take the decision and fast forward, uh, hey, I want this done, I want an answer by the end of the week. Well, right. it won't happen by the end of the week in Italy because if, they're, if we're going to talk to that family-owned business, um, they may have a different timeline. So the right. timeline of the corporate business may not be equal to the timeline of the family-run business with whom they partner. Plus, so I think it's example. important to know that family business doesn't mean small business. There are huge family-owned businesses in Italy still that um, yeah. set the corporate yeah. cultural tone for the country. Well, so, some of the biggest Italian companies that you might be familiar with, dear, dear attendees, are, in essence, still family businesses. And we're, we're talking about... Um, uh, one company that comes to mind is Luxottica, one of the biggest frame makers in the world, right? Um, owned by uh, Signore Del Vecchio, a, 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 a traditional Italian entrepreneur, right? Uh, yeah, a comment box here, Salvador Ferragamo. Yeah, fa fashion yes. industry. A lot of that is still in, 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 in living at least that family culture. Yeah. And then, and that's a family business culture. But then to that, there is the real family. And I have countless uh, uh, examples of being in Italy and uh, visiting one of my best friends because guess what? I'm there for two weeks. I'm going to see everybody. everybody wants to see me. Everybody knows I'm coming. And I can drop in anybody's business, no matter the importance of the business, and everybody will drop off everybody, everything that they're doing to go have an espresso al bar con me, with me, uh, and they will put the client work on hold. So family intermingles with business. Family doesn't take this, uh, oh, after hours uh, uh, role. Mm -hmm. it, it intermingles with us right. all the time. Right. Uh, la bella figura. La bella figura is another uh, um, value of us. And la bella figura translated means uh, the nice figure. And that doesn't really uh, uh, only refer to women dressed nicely. Uh, if, in fact, we have another slide uh, where we have the soccer team all sharing, you know, beautiful suits and, uh, and that too is kind of part of the La Bella Figura. La Bella Figura That's is- That's why I suited great. up today, just for you. Yeah, there you go. Um, lots of uh, good looking boys in pretty sharp suits. <laughs> and it's a soccer team, right? So imagine when we're doing business in an office, how everybody has this sense of the formality, this sense of Bella Figura. But let me talk about Bella Figura because sometimes people think it has to do only with the image. Uh-uh. La Bella Figura uh, is, of course, the opposite of La Brutta Figura. And let me tell you, in the South, this is a way, way more important than in the North. 
because uh, the keeping up appearances, your relationships with people play a big role in making sure that you're not losing face. So if you're doing business with somebody and that person owes you an answer, but they can't give you quite a straight answer, is because in the back of their mind is like, wait a minute, I have this many relationships that I have to be careful and I have to continue to nurture. Hmm. So let me check with them first, because if I don't and I do a faux pas, that's a brutta figura. Hmm. And that can actually ruin a lot of things that go down a list of like, uh, who referred me to you, uh, you are my, my brother's best friend, and, and so forth. So those are intricate layers of relationships uh, as pertaining to La Bella or La Bruta Figura yeah. are playing constantly a very important role that is not necessarily visible to you during the cult cross-cultural exchange. Uh, Thanks, for for that Thanks for that clarification. I think that was critical. Yeah. So formality doesn't have to be also, it doesn't have to do with how I show myself in a suit and formal wear and all of that. But if you are in a meeting or if you watch even how uh, certain meetings are, or presentations are done in Italy, um, there is a sense like people are aggrandizing the VP, aggrandizing the president, they're putting on a pedestal. That's a formality for us. I, uh, I place this person in a certain uh, environment uh, with a certain title because for you, it me it's a piece of the roadmap that you need to navigate. If you know who this person is, then you know the relationship to that person and the other people relating to that and how you have to walk, talk around and behave around that person. That's why they give... Uh, you know, things like, oh, uh, buongiorno, dottore, questo è il signor, uh, dottor, non il signor, but dottor Cimino, which mm. means uh, a, a lot more importance is given to dottor Cimino than perhaps uh, the project manager on the, uh, on the call, the director of sales mm -hmm. on the call, etc. Mm -hmm. And that is a key, too, that uh, you don't want to ask uh, the project manager or the director of sales for a decision, because if that person is in the room, uh, they have to talk to each other. Maybe the decision of the question needs to be addressed to that person instead. So it's a roadmap. And that also goes back to say hierarchy is, is a, a little bit um, crossing over with formality. Formality also refers to the language, to the tone. The Italians, uh, uh, if they want to lower the formality in the way of having built a rapport with you and they feel like even it, we do it all the time with Italian, among Italians ourselves. If I am talking to a person from, the, from another region, from another family that I don't know, I do not dare uh, talking to that person using the pronoun tu, but yes. I use the lei, the yeah. formal. So even the language has an inbuilt formality to how have I, I'm going to address somebody until I'm given the permission to drop formality. And often people would say, non ti preoccupare, dammi del tu, mm. address so, me with the so, tu pronoun. And it's a key that you can lower the formalities in that way. G Gina is asking uh, if you could expand a little bit on la passeggiata and, and what it means in Italy. What's la passeggiata? Uh, la passeggiata, too, can mean a lot of things. But mostly la passeggiata is a straw, right? La passeggiata is a straw that somebody takes. Uh, it can, if you have, for instance, if sometimes somebody has to talk to you about something more personal, wants to go deeper, there is more to say, oh, let me give you some insight about somebody else's. So we Facciamoci go for a walk. Let, let's go for a yeah, walk and talk say, about it. Facciamoci una passeggiata. So we'll mm. go along the river or uh, in piazza. Facciamoci una passeggiata. 100% of the times in the middle of the day comes with a, a stop al bar for an espresso. Of course. And, you know, <laughs> and so un, and un that's an... Un bicchiere de prosecco. Oh. Oh, yeah, if it's closer to lunch, maybe it's un bicchiere di vino. Uh, so uh, la passeggiata is a, another opportunity for there is more to this. I should expect uh, more information coming or, right? So, and of course, it's also a leisure time to go and relax. For il dolce far niente, la bella vita, la dolce vita. So, did, so did, we talked... Did, did, did you want to spend more time on, 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 on hierarchies or are you, are you okay with moving on? From well, that? Uh, hierarchy, I think I, I was going to, I said that it cross paths a little bit with the formality, right. you know, that uh, in hierarchy sometimes is also another reason why, and I, I'd say hierarchy and bureaucracy. What uh, uh, stops some people or the projects that tend to extend, the Italians are later giving you answer. They said they will do it this week, but then they call you and they say, uh, I need a little more time. All has to do with uh, going through the hierarchy for permissions, but also 
in uh, a knowledge in the bureaucracy of things because not everything is uh, just a, a stamp from the CEO. Uh, yeah. There might be other regulation yeah. that call for some bureaucratic processes. Right. Of- that, that, that's what this has to do with also how you, how you how you negotiate. Yes. So, so uh, I put this slide in just, this is not a, a Italian value, but you, you want to be aware that your negotiations may take a little longer because of the hierarchies uh, that you may not be intimately familiar with. And because of the, uh, the protocol or the, the government regulations, the, the bureaucracy that may come along with it. And what else comes along with it is that you have to engage into a discussion in la discussion you have to have a debate with each other and that yeah. what you saw earlier that that cross section slide th- this may be animated right so that this could be this is not a fight this is engagement correct we we have another value um also the flexibility and i want to play to flexibility slightly different two ways Flexibility doesn't mean that uh, um, uh, the flexibility has to happen both ways. The Italians are known to be flexible, to be improvising, to be creative and, and all of that. And that kind of gives us a sense of easiness with the Italians. Okay. Everybody said at the beginning, oh, it's so easy to do business with Italians. But yes, it is easy because we are so warming and so lovely and so touchy, fe- not touchy feeling in a way that, you know, we are hugging and we go for coffee and all of that. Uh, flexibility uh, it needs to also be observed in this way. Notice that the Italians that are doing more and more business globally, more and more business with a Western mindset that are maybe more individualistic, more direct, you know, uh, take more risk, are actually exercising themselves a lot of flexibility. Hmm. They actually are latching on to the fact that most people don't know how to navigate the formality culture and more and more they are adapting and okay to address you with the two. So they are quick, they're quickly moving from a formality addressing to go uh, to the two and being more friendly. They right. may be formally opening a meeting, placing everybody on the pedestal who needs to be on the pedestal, the president this, and they do it formally, but then they probably lower the formality. And that's an, exa- an adjusting the other way. Right. So. Excellent. I want to address because we're, we're heading close. We're getting close to the full hour. I want to address it. Um, we're going to go a little longer um, as we predicted that we would. And that's perfectly all right. We have the flexibility. Um, and those of you who c- cannot allow themselves to be that flexible, um, no worries. We will keep recording this until we're through with the material. We will be sharing it with you if you have to go um, Godspeed and off to your next project. Those of you who want to stay on, uh, we're going to take another 10 minutes to complete this t- today. So yeah, along with... Um, maybe you want to remind them that we are planning to offer actually an extended uh, webinar. Exactly. Right. So Antimo and I are putting together a an actual online training course to dive into this topic in, into the depth that it deserves and it needs. This is a teaser for you. This is to get you mouth watering and uh, this is an antipasto. Uh, but il primo, il secondo, and le dolci will will come in our in our actual uh, online course. So uh, building relationships. How how important is that in order to get anything done? We saw task versus relationship on the globe smart. Yes, it is paramount relationships are paramount the how you build them uh, trust is paramount um, building trust with italians takes time because uh, that's why they take the passeggiata sometimes to want to know you as a friend as a human being aside from your role in the organization the, it, the for them to understand who you are emotionally who uh, your fa- something about your family, something about your story, gives them pieces of the patchwork about uh, what is the Christian made of? Uh, can I trust Christian? When I know I can trust Trist- Christian, what does Christian look like? Because mm. uh, there is this um, diffidence maybe about, do I have a persona in front of me or do I actually have Antimo in front of me? Right. Uh, is he and- playing a role? Right. This was important because Antimo and I, we don't go back very much. So we, 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 we uh, our industries, our, our work has cross sected, but we, we, we don't have a relationship for, for a long time. So when, when we were introduced to each other and I, I was looking for somebody to, to do this workshop with, uh, somebody recommended talk to Antimo. You have to talk to Antimo. So we scheduled a call to get to know each other. And I knew 
I, I, th this first call would last at least an hour because otherwise we wouldn't have a relationship. We wouldn't be doing this together un un unless we, we, we would have that sense of mutual trust with each other, right? And if for me, uh, as an Italian too, I feel unfair if I have to constantly look at an agenda and hit what uh, uh, I'm expected to do because it plays against my being natural and my being authentic. So if I have an important thing to share, I will share it and you'll know it's important because I exude it with my energy, with my passion. Mm -hmm. But if I have constantly, if I, as an Italian, I have to be worried in a, in a meeting to hit that half an hour mark, to hit this, then all of a sudden you're getting a persona, not an antimo. Right. Uh, and that uh, I think is important. And that's why, again, oftentimes the Italians will make time for social and the social times that, you know, let's go, andiamo a pranzo, andiamo a prenderci un bicchiere di vino becomes two hours, three hours. And uh, yeah. But, but if I don't like uh, alcohol, I've had this on a, on a call, on a, on a webinar the other day. What, what if I, either because of my religion or because of personal dietary restrictions, if I don't drink alcohol, um, is, it, is that a, a hindrance to building that relationship in Italian? No, it's not. It's not an hindrance. It's not offensive. I think it goes back to be vulnerable and authentic and say, this is the reason why I don't drink. I don't drink. I don't mm -hmm. like wine. Whatever the case is. But uh, it's not about the sharing the wine. The wine is a, is a vehicle, not in itself. It's an, a, an excuse that can be very much substituted by a drink of water and you're just accomplishing the same thing. The passage right. is happening, the sharing is happening. It's not, it's, so don't be preoccupied with drinking the espresso or drinking the coffee. In fact, most, most likely- what you drink. Uh, yes, like at noon, most likely, uh, let me do this for sake of uh, a little fun. The American will be drinking a cappuccino and the Italian a glass of wine. <laughs> and, and for I, us, drinking I, a I cappuccino have, after I have, this, I have this argument with my wife because she wants a cappuccino even after dinner. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is not, no, cappuccino is for breakfast. After you, that, you want to shock, you want to shock an Italian during even a travel, business meeting, whatever. Have a cappuccino with your with your lunch, and they will just go like we've seen a phantom, okay. right? You got, you got to clarify this for me, Antimo. What's the what's the bigger faux pas? Um, a milky coffee drink uh, outside of the breakfast time, or um, grating cheese over a seafood dish? What's, yeah, what's, what's, what's both. The you both looked at as scenes. One is bad, and one it's not so bad. Putting cheese, and as a chef, putting cheese over fish for the most part is a sin. Yeah, so, uh, and also, uh, <laughs> typically you wake up with a cappuccino and an espresso. So most, uh, most of the time after 10, 11, not many Italians will ask for a cappuccino al bar. They will ask for an espresso, maybe caffè macchiato. But these are the do's and don'ts, the faux pas of the Italians and little things. So um, spontaneity and festosità. Let, let, let's focus on this as the, as the, as the last uh, value that you want to highlight. Fun. This, you know, conviviality, this is what the fun character of the Italians, the warm Italian, the taking care of you Italian comes uh, through. And, that, and you see it in north to south. By, uh, I don't want to make a big difference here. Uh, perhaps the biggest difference you see is that uh, in the south, because it is warmer, especially from May to uh, end of September, uh, people will have long, long lunches. Uh, two, three hours, especially if it's Saturday and Sunday. On any given day will be an hour. And then you have this long pause where people uh, are doing a riposino, they are sleeping and, uh, and then come alive again at, uh, in the evening around six or seven. Uh, during the evening, uh, for instance, in the South especially, you will see people gathering in the piazza or pulling out a chair out on their street and gathering with the neighbors at, uh, at the open fresh air socializing. Uh, you will see evenings in the summertime where people um, will go back to work between seven and eight, uh, go shower and clean up uh, at home and go out for dinner at 10, 11. And they're mm. not eating until midnight and mm. we're socializing until 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. This is conviviality. This is, um, and we're not worried about, oh my God, I got to go to work tomorrow. I'm still going to work tomorrow, but this time is extremely important. And with I, the family, and with currently, friends. currently, this is so hard to do, right? With with our personal uh, 
with our physical distancing that we have to practice how and and is, is this one of the reasons that made it so hard for italians to to uh, stay apart from each other during during the COVID crisis? Is, is, this, is this a challenge for Italians more so, or for Mediterranean cultures more so than for Nordic it has, cultures? It has played a role, but I don't think that in these extreme circumstances that uh, was the, the thing that was worrying most people. The results per absolutely that we've seen uh, in COVID-19 uh, is uh, the density of the population, the age of the population. There are several reasons, but well, everybody has, itching to socialize you've seen many many images of how again creative flexive improvising people have been uh, reaching out with glasses across the balcony or singing, making music and all, singing across the city or from balcony to balcony right? creating songs from balcony uh, way way far away and yeah. they inspired the entire world to do the same the uploading at 7 p.m uh, for the healthcare staff these are the Italians, and I think yeah. uh, uh, I will say it's very likely that everything started from Italy, that behavior, that social, that communal, that caring, and then slowly has spread. So that's also the Italians. Yeah. Well, th thank you for, for sharing your personal insights around this. And I, I can, not only do I sense your passion, which is, is, is natural, um, I, I also feel a a, a strong desire to to be in Italy right now, which is really hard for me because as 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 many Germans as as many Germans will tell you, um, Italy has always been traditionally our first uh, real foreign cultural experience, especially the Southern Germans, um, because that's that's the closest culture with a warm climate that we could get to. So. For for I, I can speak for my family, for my extended family, for my friends, circle of friends. Italy has always been near and dear to my heart, and and I, I my heart aches seeing what's happening to the country because of COVID. So um, I can't wait to go back. Right, I can't wait to be back in in La Bella Italia and and to enjoy the people, enjoy Italian culture, which is it has has been, I think one of the one of the cradles of European society, if you will. And sure, there, there's things that you may not like about Italian culture, but it is how, how we as, as Europeans, and when I say we, I mean the two of us and many others who are on this, on this webinar, it, it, has, it has laid the foundation for our societal systems, for our legal systems, for how we organize our cities, how we, how we are with each other. So whether we're Italians or not, Many of us are Italians at heart, so I thank you for being on here with me today, Antimo. Yeah, thank and you for the opportunity. I hope uh, whoever of you needs to go deeper into this uh, particular dealing and doing business with Italians, understanding the Italians, feel free to reach out. Yes, We are very excited about putting this program together in uh, sometimes in mid-June or toward the end of June. Yes. And uh, so we dates. can go deeper. We're still massaging the dates. We want to give us some time to design this. We we decided this spontaneously and very flexibly on the go, right? As because that's an Italian value and we embody you know, it. Is, allow me to say that if anybody on the call is actually needing more, wanting more, and liking how this was done, uh, please uh, contact us. Tell yes. us what you need. Uh, give us what you're struggling with because I think that is even more helpful to help you more directly mm -hmm. with what has been your challenges dealing with Italians, what has been your history and what are you trying to achieve, etc. Right. Um, and, and that would be, would help us design it specifically for you. This will be an open enrollment course until we have one client come to us and say, hey, in our company, we have 15 people and we want it specifically for us. We'll do that as well. But right now we're offering a, a two times two hours online training. We live in a world where we cannot come to you right now physically. So we come to you to your screens and we will do this together, Antimo and I, and we will provide what you saw here was a teaser was an antipasto. We'll provide a, a fuller mm -hmm. meal a full meal in, in our two times two hour session. Dates, as you see, are to be confirmed, but we're shooting for the, the second half or late June, maybe going into early July, depending on how it goes. Um, you see the fee that we are envisioning and it'll be all in your inbox. Those of you who are on this webinar, you get first dibs and you will hear about it first. If you 
want to stay in touch with us, which we certainly would encourage, here is how you do that. Um, there's emails, there are phone numbers. I'm on the East Coast, so it is 2.10 p.m. at uh, Eastern time. Antimo is on the Pacific Coast, okay. which makes it 11.10 at his hour right now. And we work around the globe anyway. So we're, do you ever sleep, Antimo? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm pretty particular in my best sleep. Okay. By 9 a.m., 9 a.m. I'm asleep, but by 5:36, I am up and wired. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. The, the, this was this was beautiful. Um, thank, thank you very, very much. much. Gra grazie mille, Antimo. Um, thank you, everybody, for staying on so long. We went a little long. Ciao a tutti in Italia e in tutto il mondo. Ciao. Ci vediamo. Ciao ciao. Ciao ciao.